Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, firstly, my name is Bao Li Wang, and I'm from Unisoc, as well as working at Linaro Kernel Group as one well assignee. So in this topic, I want to share some work I did about the suspended time compensa compensation issue. So if you have any, any questions or confusions uh, uh, for my expression, please raise your hand to stop me. Or I still will leave some time for questions at last. So OK, let's start. Uh, in this topic, I want to introduce five parts. Firstly, I want to give some uh, backgrounds for the suspend time compensation. And uh, secondly, I will introduce some problems we met uh, when uh, compensating the when compensating the suspend time and how to show uh, these uh, these problems and uh, spend some time to talk about what we need to do in future and the last part is for questions okay so first I will introduce some background for the suspend time the suspend time as the name shows uh, that means the time consumed from uh, system sleep to system wake up. So, uh, why we need to uh, uh, compensate the suspend time? Uh, the ta as we know, the time keeping will not be updated due to the clock source uh, and the clock events are suspended. Uh, but when system resumes, uh, we want to compensate the suspend time as soon as possible because some processes or drivers uh, will require the correct system, system time. For example, when I wake up my cell phone, I want to see the correct uh, system time on the screen. So now there, uh, now there are three ways in kernel to compensate the system time. Uh, according to the choosing preference, the uh, non-stop clock source, persistent clock, and uh, RTC. So let's see how the non-stop clock source work. Um, when system starts to suspend, uh, the timekeeping suspend function, in timekeeping suspend function, we will read the current cycles from the non-stop clock source we name the C1, and then the system suspends. And when system starts to resume, uh, in timekeeping resume function, we will read the current cycles from non-stop clock source again, we named C2. So uh, we, now we can get one delta cycle by C2 minus C1. And uh, we can uh, convert the uh, delta cycles to suspend time by this formula. So la the last step, we can inject the suspend time to the time keeping. So now the timekeeping uh, will show the correct uh, system time. And for persistent clock, it is almost similar with uh, the non-stop clock source, but we don't need to convert the current cycles to the suspended time, since we can read the suspended time from the persistent clock. OK. It, the workflow is very is easy to understand. So. Next is for RTC. Uh, if there are no non-stop clock source or persistent clock in your system, we will try to use RTC to uh, compensate the suspend time. Uh, it is also similar with the persistent clock. Okay. So uh, next, I will introduce uh, some problems we met for each method. The first week. Uh, the first uh, problem is we met for the non-stop clock source. And uh, in current uh, timekeeping call, we have some logics to compensate the suspend time by non-stop clock source. But uh, suppose one case we met on our Spectrum platform. On our Spectrum platform, we will use one higher resolution clock source named the CS1 uh, to be selected as the uh, current cloud source for timekeeping, but uh, this cloud source will be stopped in suspend state. And we have another uh, lower resolution cloud source we named the CS2, but 
uh, this cloud source, it is non-stop in suspend. So ideally, we want to use CS1 for timekeeping and use CS2 for, uh, to compensate the suspend time. But the timekeeping call now only supports the non-stop cloud source if that, if that non-stop cloud source is the current cloud source for timekeeping. That means if the non-stop cloud source is not the current cloud source for timekeeping, we cannot use this non-stop cloud source to compensate the suspend time. So that's the problem. So we, we, we should use choose persistent clock RTC instead. So according to the problem, the solution one is the, we can figure out the uh, solution one easily uh, by register one persistent clock using, uh, we can register the non-stop timer as one persistent clock by implementing the read persistent clock CT4 in driver, but uh, this is not a good idea because uh, if other platforms met the same issue, so we will introduce more duplicate code uh, to calculate the air shift and the cycles converting. And this solution also cannot be compatible with the different architectures. Uh, for ARM architecture, we should uh, uh, use the use one wrapper function named the register persistent persistent clock to register one uh, persistent clock. But for x86 uh, architecture, we should implement the get wall clock interface to injure, to register one persistent clock. But for ARM CT4 architecture, we should implement the read persistent clock CT4 directly. So after thinking this, we dropped uh, solution one quickly. So according to solution one problem, we, I, I propose the solution two, which introducing one common persistent clock framework. And in this framework, uh, we, uh, in, for this, uh, each non-timer, non-stop timer can be registered into this framework. And in this framework, we supply some common code to deal with the mount shift and uh, cycles converting. And uh, in this framework, we implement only one read persistent clock CT4 function instead of uh, in different architectures. So it can be compatible with different architectures. This solution, seems can work, but it is still not the best solution because we have no reason to invent uh, another set of data structures which just uh, copy from the clock source and uh, some similar read, uh, read functions uh, with a sequence counter. And another, we can use this helper function. We can, can avoid introducing extra mount shift parameters when converting the cycles. And finally, the clock source are registered with all required data uh, in the clock source core. So we, we, should, and we should expand the timekeeping and the clock core to handle this issue. So according to the time maintainers, suggestion, uh, we introduce one suspended cloud source for timekeeping uh, cloud source core to compensate the uh, suspended time. So let's see how, how the suspended cloud, source, uh, suspended cloud source work. Firstly, we should uh, select one suspended cloud source. Uh, the suspended cloud source must be non-stop in suspend, that means this flag, is, this flag must be set. And secondly, we, we do not uh, supply resume uh, suspend interface for the clock source uh, OPS uh, because we want to use this clock source in suspend state. And we always pick the best rating. And finally, the, the, 
the suspended clauses can be current clauses for time keeping or not. That means one non-stop timer can be selected as the suspended clauses as well as the current clauses for time keeping. So after select one suspended clauses, uh, we should start to marry the suspended time. Uh, firstly, we should check uh, if current clauses is the same with the suspended clauses. If they are same, we should use the cycle values from timekeeping core as the start of suspended cycles to avoid the same reading from the suspended clauses. If they are not, we should enable the suspended clauses firstly, if possible. Then we should uh, then read the suspended clauses cycles from the suspended clauses. Then after, uh, after that, the system will go to sleep state. And uh, uh, when system starts to re resume, we should stop measuring the suspended timing. Firstly, we should, we should still check if current clauses is the same with the suspended clauses. If they are same, we should use the cycle values from timekeeping as current cycles to avoid the same reading from the suspended clauses. So if they are not same, we should read uh, the si current cycles from the suspended clauses. And uh, according to previous non-stop workflow, we can convert uh, these data cycles to uh, nanoseconds by this helper function and inject the suspended time for timekeeping. Uh, last step, we can disable the suspended clauses to saving power if possible. That, depend, that depends on if the current uh, cloud source is the same with the sus suspended cloud source. If they are same, we cannot <coughs> disable the suspended cloud source because it is also used for timekeeping. So uh, when calculating the suspended time, we should consider the cloud source mutex issue because uh, as we know, uh, the cloud source core will hold the cloud source mutex lock to select, register, or unbind one cloud source. So, do we need to hold the, the cloud source the cloud source mutex lock when calculating the suspend time? So, after th after some thinking and the discussion uh, with Daniel or John, uh, we think we don't we we do not need the cloud source mutex lock because um, when we start to uh, marry the suspended time uh, from timekeeping suspend function, uh, now uh, system, the system's processes are freezed, and now CPUs and the interrupts uh, the, and the interrupts are disabled now. So now there is no risk to select, register, or unbind one cloud source. So. Uh, it is uh, possible to calculate the certain time without holding the mutex lock to remove, to remove the uh, compensation efficiency. Uh, another small thing we should consider how to unbind one suspended cloud source. Uh, if we want to unbind one suspended cloud source from the user space, uh, the kernel will try to install uh, replacement uh, suspended cloud source. Uh, if there are no uh, replacement suspended cloud source, uh, we will just let the cloud source go and have no sus suspended cloud source in system now. So the system will uh, try to compensate the sus suspended time uh, through persistent pers clock or RTC instead. Okay, solution three was accepted uh, because uh, we, it supplies one common mechanism to be compatible with uh, different architectures. And we didn't invent a new, uh, we didn't invent some uh, similar structures and we didn't introduce complexity. Uh, now there are still three cases to handle the uh, suspended time. 
And also, uh, we add some power saving consideration. Uh, when uh, we will disable the suspended cloud source if the cl suspended cloud source is not used. Okay, this for this is the problem and the solution for the non-stop cloud source. So next is for the precision clock. The precision clock is one weird clock which cannot be registered as one uh, cloud source or RTC. Um, the problems we met is some architecture, some architectures still uh, implement the obsolete read precision clock interface to uh, register one precision clock, and this this API is obsolete, and because uh, it is not 2038 uh, year safe, and if you don't know the don't or don't understand the 2038 issue, you can ask and he's here. And we should uh, replace the, this obsolete uh, interface with the read proceeding clock CT4. Okay. So uh, firstly, we want to remove the obsolete um, API. So as we know, and Bogman did one big clean up for some dead architectures so with these dead architectures going away, uh, some redundant read proceeding clock uh, interface are removed too. So such as the Blackfin FRV or M32R architecture. So we continue. Uh, we also uh, convert the proceeding, the weird proceeding clock to RTC or cloud source instead, like ArcSH and or OMAP counter 32 driver. And if the proceeding clock cannot be removed, also uh, cannot be converted to RTC or clock source, we should convert to use the read proceeding clock CT4 interface, uh, such as these uh, architectures, uh, we will uh, convert these architectures. Uh, this is for the proceeding clock. So if there are no uh, non-stop clock source uh, or proceeding clock in your system, uh, the system will try to use RTC to compensate the suspend time through the RTC suspend and the RTC resume interface. The problems we met, um, first uh, is also the 2030-year issue and both and and I have sent some patches to fix this issue. And another problem we met is the uh, expiration risk. According to our investigation for all the RTC drivers we found, uh, one driver will be expired before year 2013, 2017, and seven drivers will be expired before year 2038, and uh, 23 drivers will be expired before year 20 CT9 and the 72 drivers will be expired before the year 2100 and um, more than 100 drivers will be expired before uh, year 2106. So we must find one software solution to avoid the expiration risk, uh, although the RTC hardware limitation is confirmed. So the basic, sorry. So the basic concept we figure out is um, introducing one range offset for RTC, so we can uh, add the offset uh, when reading when reading from the RTC and uh, subtract subtract the offset when writing back to RTC. So. In this way, we can expand the RTC software range. So for, first step, we should introduce uh, two fields uh, named the range max and the range mean uh, to present the RTC hardware real range. And the driver can set the ranges. And uh, the benefit we get is uh, we can validate the, the RTC ranges in RTC core instead of each driver. The second, second step, uh, we should add, add one field 
named start seconds for RTC, and we can uh, set the start seconds through DT or drivers and unite its seconds. So when we set the start seconds, range max, range mean for the RTC device, uh, when register uh, the RTC device, the RTC core will calculate the offset seconds between the start seconds and the RTC hardware range. So when we use the RTC to uh, read or set time, uh, the RTC core will add the offset to the time when reading from the RTC hardware and uh, uh, subtract it when writing writing back to the RTC hardware. Uh, because we, because the unit of this field is seconds, so we can, so which can uh, avoid the leap year issue. That's the benefit we get. So in this way, we can avoid the RTC uh, expiration risk. Okay, um, next is some future work. Um, for the persistent clock, we still need to remove the obsolete uh, read persistent clock. Um, um, from now, uh, almost architectures are cleaned up, but except uh, the SH architecture, and uh, have sent uh, patches several times, but the maintainer didn't get, give any feedback. So uh, I think and we will send patches to the time maintainer directly to remove the last user of the obsolete interface. For ITC, continue to fix the 2030 issue and uh, add hardware ranges for each driver. Um, that is one. Uh, open questions because there are still three cases, non-stop clock source, uh, proceeding clock, and RTC to compensate the suspend time. Um, it can be simplified. Um, we had some discussion before with Daniel Joy, and Daniel proposed the one interesting suggestion, and he suggested we can introduce a couple of OPS to be filled at initial time. Instead of, uh, uh, according to the uh, choosing preference, instead of uh, uh, to check if they are, uh, if they are uh, non-stop clock source or persistent clock in system. So, uh, but we didn't get, uh, get a consensus now. Uh, it can be a possible way to clean up, um, but it, since it is close to the timekeeping, um, I think we need more uh, investigation and uh, discussion to uh, clean up the compensate, uh, compensation Action. So, if you have any good suggestion or uh, or other method, so you can post the patches. We can talk about or talk about this. Okay. Okay. Before questions, I must uh, say some thanks to these people and Mark, uh, Daniel, and Joy. Uh, Joy. Yes, they are so patient and give me lots of helps and uh, a good suggestion to me. So thank you guys. So below is some uh, patch link. You can check the patch. Okay. So I think, oh, okay. <laughs> Free mics. Uh, I was thinking about this uh, start second attribute in the device tree you were thinking about introducing for like using as a base of offset. So I'm just thinking intuitively, will that be like representing the time the, the, that system was manufactured or introduced on the market or the SOC or something like that? So it, nobody would use a time earlier than that because that's when it was manufactured or what is that supposed to be containing start seconds? Uh, so you mean here, right? Exactly that thing there on uh, 
start sex for the RTC. So you mean the start segment for the RTC? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So well, we, what's the idea about that attribute? How will that be used? Uh, sorry. Yeah, what will you put in that attribute? What what value? So oh, okay. Maybe I can answer that. So a lot of device drivers already have this implicitly. So they they have a year, month, day number, for example, and we just assume that they start in 1970 or they start in uh, the year 2000 or 2010 in some cases. Um, the, the idea would be to make that more explicit so that the driver reports the time from the start and then the start separately. And then we can just move the start based on the knowledge we have about the system, as you said. Yeah, I think there is, uh, like, a, it would be interesting to get an overview of all all the ways people have made their RTCs because there seems to be like a bunch of different ways to do it. Right. Right. Yeah. And he did that. Yeah. So we, we we know it for for 104 drivers, they fall into two major categories. They either save the number of seconds since a start date, which is typically set to 1970, but could be set to something else, or they set the number of years and days and months and seconds and sometimes less than a second. Um, and the most common case is actually where you have 100 years that are expected to be starting in 1970, which means that the RTC ends on December 31st, 1969, uh, 2069, because mm. then it wraps around to 1970. So then you could bump the RTC by setting start seconds to like when it was first introduced in the market or something like that, so you don't uh, right. waste so uh, years. In some cases we would set it in the device driver, in other cases we would let the device driver read it from device tree, or let the common code just override whatever the device driver set and read that from, from the device tree. Excellent, thanks. The bootloader may have different offsets, so the dates, if displayed in the bootloader, might be then completely off. Yeah, that, that's why we would have it in the device tree, so that the bootloader can communicate to the system what okay. it thinks. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say thanks for your work and your persistence, and apologies for my poor guidance through some of this. <laughs> so uh, apologies. I definitely appreciate your getting this through. Uh, the one area I was a little... Um, Worried about so in, in that set of priorities of you know using the continuous clock sources or the persistent clock or the RTC for suspend timing, um, you know having those three categories is very ugly and and getting down to two would be good. The difficulty with the RTCs is that because we don't know whether or not they're accessible when interrupts are off, which is the case that suspend and resume time. Um, trying to figure out. Uh, the cases where you're moving from persistent clocks down to RTCs, have you seen any issues where we're losing some precision or increasing our error on suspend and resumes, or is that something that there's, there's on those cases that didn't matter? So uh, I understand your concern. So uh, that's why we didn't get the consensus before. So. I have no idea for this now. So. I know at some point there was some talk about extending the RTC interface to provide, um, you know, IRQ off safe accessors. And so if the RTC structure had that entry, you knew you, we could use it. So you could use it directly in the timekeeping code, calling out to the RTC code. Um, that might be a way to get by. You still have to have the case where when the RTC doesn't have an IRQ off safe accessor that you just have to wait until the RTC subsystem's up to inject time. Um, so I, I haven't actually been aware of that problem with RTCs that need the interrupts to be on. Uh, what I can say is that the cases that we converted from read persistent clock to using the RTC are all cases where read persistent clock was implemented by reading the RTC. Okay, but in that case, it's likely that those had to be safe. And so the problem is, is that when, when we use the RTC for resume timing, that's all done deferred later at the resume cycle. And so you end up with extra time where different drivers might see the pre-resume time and then also some issues with the amount of error that gets injected. Um, 
but yeah, it's ho hopefully not super critical for those platforms. I don't know. We're out of time. Okay, so I think time is up. Thank you, everyone.